So the internet is just chock full of misinformation about fair use. And so is ordinary practice. And it's fascinating to see these myths grow and uh, spread. But here's, here's a basic rule of thumb about um, fair use mythology. If you heard a number, it's wrong. Don't pay attention to numbers. Like, oh, you can use 30 seconds, you can use 10 seconds, you can use 400 words. Uh, you can, if you change, if you, if you take an image and you do seven things to it, you solarize it, you turn it purple, whatever you do, uh, it, it, you've changed it enough. No, no, don't do that. Also, don't say, well, it's educational or it's nonprofit or I'm not making any money, so it's fine. No, it might not be fine. All of these things put you at risk. And let's not do that. Let's just use what we know about judicial interpretation since 1990, which has been very consistent about the most common practices of fair use, which are the ones most of us are concerned with. Most of us just uh, want to know what's, what is everybody doing and doesn't get in trouble for. Every once in a while, there's somebody who wants to step out on the edge of fair use and get wild and crazy. You know, Richard Prince, major visual artist, lives his life basically going like this to the legal system to see whether they will sue him, somebody will sue him for what he's going to claim is fair use. Great, let him be that person. If you want to be that person, you go ahead. The rest of us are just trying to do our work and not be in trouble. So when you try to, if you, if when you're looking for the safety of a number, the, the security of knowing absolutely you're in the right, you're actually putting yourself at risk. Here's what you want to know. Am I using this material for a new purpose that I could explain to an ordinary person? For instance, and I love this phrase of my, my colleague, Michael Donaldson's, the sleepy judge, the judge who has your case come up after lunch, tired cranky, not really paying attention. Could you explain that to him? Could you explain to your uncle at Thanksgiving dinner why it was different? Make it simple. If you can say that, if you can say, look, that this was made for this and that was made for that. Great. That's a different purpose. Then how much of it are you using? Are you using the whole thing? Then you should have a reason in your new use why you need the whole thing. You might have a great reason, but let's have a reason. Let's have a reason that is appropriate to the new use for everything you're going to use. And um, after, if, if those are your criteria, you're not stepping into the market of the original, uh, of the, of the original provider of the material. You're not taking anything away from them. You're building on what they did differently to make something new. And that's exactly what the constitution has designed copyright to do, to incentivate people to make new stuff. The constitution copyright law itself has created basically two different roads to incentivate people. One is, well, if you made something, we'll give you a limited copyright. And the other road is, we're gonna give you some exceptions so that you can still use copyrighted material if you need to make something new, not just take that other thing for commercial purposes of your own or non-commercial purposes of your own for, you know, just, just to be able to reuse it. We want, we want, uh, we want, what we want to see in those exception, ex exception side is that you're creating new culture in some way. And by the way, we don't even care if it's good culture, bad culture. We just really want you to be making new stuff. Most of, most of fair use is uh, being used to make things that, you know, we might think are completely trivial. Um, most of copyrighted material is, is stuff that um, might or might not stand the test of time. How many horror films? How many, how many B movies? How many trashy comic books? Uh, the, those are either, um, you know, uh, low culture or they're the treasures of the Marvel comics of the future. We're not going to know, but we're not going to pass judgment on that. All you need to do is have it be new. So when you use uh, fair use mythology, which is about the numbers, about how can I stay safe with by, by staying, making it 29 and a half seconds, 
uh, when you when you say I'm not doing anybody harm because I'm just doing this for fun or I'm just doing it for educational purposes or I'm just doing it for uh, uh, non-commercial purposes that doesn't wash that's not in that's not uh, although non-commerciality is is mentioned as a, as uh, in passing in the law it has not been important in judicial interpretation um, you're putting yourself and your colleagues at risk and you're putting your new culture at risk so use use the reasoning, use the logic, and also realize that many people before you have probably done something like what you're doing. So let's learn from their collective experience. And that's where we go to the codes of best practices, which are at cmsimpact.org slash fair dash use. Uh, there's um, about 14 of them now, and uh, they they cover everything from nonfiction uh, uh, writing to software preservation to uh, uh, the work of academic and research librarians to um, middle school media literacy teachers to music librarians um, to visual artists and documentary filmmakers and journalists. They're between many different practices, I think you probably as a cre creator of some kind, including a podcast creator, you would probably find some guidance for you in what is normal, what is acceptable, what people will find, including judges, will find uncontroversial. 